my father's place, proclaiming Jesus Christ to the world. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. I'm here today to speak something that the Lord laid on my heart and he just just gave me the whole set of scriptures and everything last Sunday afternoon when I was sitting with him. And then he had to move things around to get them in the position he wanted them. And so I'm so thankful he does that because when his hand is upon everything that I do, it's anointed by him. He's got his hand on me all the time. And I'll tell you more as we go. Now, you'll need to go to Isaiah 51, verses 7 through 8. That's where we'll start. We'll be going to a lot of places, but know that you can always go to my blog site from deathtolife.wordpress.com if you want to play catch up later. <laughs> but listen to the words. Don't be trying to find everything in your Bible. Just listen to the words, to the truth, and then you can check later to see if what I'm saying is true in the Word. Amen. So the title of today's message is Those Who Know Righteousness. And there's a very clear point the Lord wants me to make starting right out, but I will pray first, and then I will make that very clear point to you. Lord, thank you for revealing truth to me. When you reveal it to me, it is so that I can reveal it to others. And Lord, you have given me a very good way to show that this is true, not by me trying to prove my position, but by me showing your very words that are about what you identify as righteousness, your definition of it. So as I speak this, anoint, I pray. Anoint the words you have given me. And may I speak them in your power, by your spirit, in your name. Amen. Those who know righteousness. So... The Lord has these really awesome promises to those who know righteousness and have his law within their hearts written there. And the promise is this, his righteousness and his salvation is forever. There's no end to it. You won't have it for a little bit and then have it go away when you do what he has told me to tell you to do in this message. It will be forever, permanent, period. Glory to God. Oh, to know his righteousness. Ah, to know it is to personally experience it. The Hebrew word is yada. And it's the same word used for the intimacy of a marriage. But this is a holy intimacy. This is an intimate knowing the Lord experiencing it. He says, no righteousness. That means you have to experience it personally within you. Then you love his law and you do it gladly, gladly. And you do it effortlessly because he has written it on your heart within you. So when you know his righteousness and his law is within you, then you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Just like in 2 Corinthians 5.21, that's what Paul says all Christians are to be. You are to be the righteousness of God in Christ and bear all of his divine righteous fruit. And you are his witness here when all that has happened. You are the evidence that when he makes a promise, he keeps it. You are the amen to what he has done. Yes, Lord, you've done it in me. So righteousness defined is the next thing he wants me to do because many people do not understand what it is and they will believe false teachers who teach them that it is some kind of legal transaction between you and God. Certainly, Christ died that you may be saved from God's wrath and reconciled to him 
But when he speaks of righteousness, it's never in that way. Never. I'll show it to you. They will say, oh, you are in right standing. You are right when you stand before God. He'll say, oh, you're right. You're good. You're fine. You're pure. You're great. Um, welcome to heaven. Just a right position, some kind of legal transaction, that that's what righteousness is. Legally, you receive his seal of approval. Now that you have said you believe in Jesus, they will say, why, you are right before God no matter what else you do, O oh infant in Christ. It doesn't make any difference if you still disobey him. He is blind to your sin. He will not see it. The, the legal transaction is complete and done forever. That's what they'll say. It's a lie. As I have said, he never speaks of righteousness that way in the word. So, through the scriptures that I will show you today, you will find out the truth. And the truth is that it's something he works inside of you, not a legal transaction. Every time he speaks of it, it's from that position. He is speaking of you intimately knowing him and having his righteousness inside of you. I'm going to repeat that a lot of times because that's when you are right in his eyes, when his righteousness is in you. He is speaking of his righteousness within you and his law written on your heart by his finger. Glory to God. He will do it if you will hear and heed these words today. So this is his definition, not man's, not false teachers. This is his definition of righteousness and his promise regarding it from Isaiah 51, 7 through 8. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law. That's the definition. That's the definition. If his law is in your heart, then he is in you, and you are righteous with his righteousness. So listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law, do not fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings, that is their mockings and insults. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool, but my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generation. Oh my. So, and then in Jeremiah 31, 33, just to drive that home, he speaks this through Jeremiah 150 years later. But this is the covenant. This is the contract, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. This is the promise that I will do in Israel later. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. Sound familiar? And I will be their God, and they will be my people. So, what are the promises to those who know righteousness, as he has said here, to those who have his law written in their heart? Oh, he will be their God. They will be his people. And all that he has promised, his righteousness and his salvation, will be forever in them. He puts his law in us, writing it with his finger. We delight to do his will, because his love is in us, and his righteousness is in us, and he is in us, and so we just love him. And we do everything that he says, because he's taken out the unrighteousness in us in order for his righteousness to be in us. Glory to God. He has removed 
our sin-sick hearts. I'll speak to you of that from Ezekiel 36 shortly. He has removed the sin-sickness of our hearts. He has plucked those hard hearts right out of our chest and replaced them with a heart that responds to his every whisper. When you are one who knows righteousness and in whose heart his law has been written, you can say that of yourself. Glory to God. So therefore, we don't fear. We aren't concerned. We don't run away when people insult us and threaten us even and mock us and laugh at us and say, oh, you're so heavenly minded. You're no earthly good. Do you know what I say to such ones? You are so earthly minded. You are no heavenly good. Therefore, repent. Amen. So we expect them to persecute us. Jesus says that will happen in John 15, 20. So we don't fear, we don't draw back, because we know that the Lord doesn't desire that any perish, and you will if you keep sinning. He doesn't desire that any perish, but that all repent, that all repent. So we continue, we don't go away. <laughs> They'd like us to, but we don't. <laughs> we don't go away because we know he doesn't want them to perish. We know because he is in us, we don't want them to perish. And so we keep speaking and living the truth of this word. And the hope and our prayer is that some will hear and do what we tell them is the truth. Tell them from this word. Don't pluck it out of the air. It's right here. So Israel did not obey God. And they suffered the consequences. Northern Israel was taken into captivity by the world empire of that day, which was Assyria. Southern Israel, Judah, was taken into captivity 150 years later at the hands of Babylon, which had taken over and become the world empire. They had defeated the Assyrians. So, but to those and to you, he speaks this promise, this covenant. It's not only for those who are Christians now, who are infants in Christ now, but it's for Israel. Israel is not out of the picture. If you have heard from the pulpit that, he, that Israel is out of the picture, then those people who are speaking to you are not of God, because in Romans 9 through 11, chapters 9 through 11, he very specifically says through Paul that Israel will come in. Those who are true Israel, who believe into him, into Christ. So this new contract, this new thing that God did was accomplished through Christ's death, resurrection, ascension, glorification at the right hand of the Father, from which he was sent. And then, after he was glorified, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to any who will obey his command to stay and wait. Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Outpouring. Like a thunderstorm that suddenly comes and just absolutely overwhelms with rain. My goodness. But, it's not a pouring on, it's a pouring in. Ezekiel 36, 27, and I will put my spirit within you. And the original Hebrew word for put means pour. I will pour my spirit, not over you, not outside of you, but within you. 
oh my goodness, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, my divine law, and do them. Well, the them isn't in the original Hebrew. You will keep and do my judgments, my divine law. It's written on your heart. Oh my goodness, he's put his righteousness within you. See how these connect? I will pour my spirit within you. Well, if he pours his spirit within you, the Holy Spirit is God. And we know from Jesus Christ's promises that he and the Father will come and indwell us also. Well, then his righteousness is in you. It can never be your own. You cannot possibly make yourself right before God. When he fills you, he fills you completely. He pours the Holy Spirit within you, pours it out. He doesn't gradually dribble a few drops here and there. And progressively, as some people say, over time, you are filled. No. It's a moment of time experience, and he immediately pours out his spirit, his righteousness, all of his divine characteristics into you in a moment of time. Glory to God. And that's from Romans 5, 5. To overflowing, he will pour his love in your heart. He will pour his love, his divine love, not love for him, his love in your heart to overflowing. He will pour, baby. (laughs) Hallelujah. He will pour. Thank you, Jesus. Then you will intimately experience his righteousness. Mm. And his law will be a delight for you to do. So you see that this is a righteousness that is not a legal contract. I'm going to continue to show you more. But can you already see this is not what you have been told it is? That you're right since you said some words at an altar. And even though you're still sinning, God can't see it. This contract has been made. You have signed it. Okay, I believe in Jesus. Therefore, you're right with God. That isn't at all what he calls righteousness. I'll continue So how do you possess his righteousness? How are you filled with his righteousness by his spirit, as I've already spoken from Ezekiel? He says that in order to possess the promises, the forever promises of his righteousness in you forever, ah, and his law written on your heart forever, yes, you must possess, you must possess his righteousness and his law within you. That is righteousness. That is the righteousness of God in Christ. He makes you the righteousness of God, not your own, the righteousness of God in Christ. When you are in Christ and you obey Christ's commands, I'll get to that. Matter of fact, I'll get to it right now. Look, here it is in my notes. Luke 24, 49. And he said to his disciples, after he had risen and was about to ascend to the Father, he said, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of the Father. Oh, these promises about his righteousness forever and about his law within you forever. Oh my, these promises. I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city, stay in the city until you are clothed with that inwardly given is what that really means. Power from on high, inwardly given power from on high, his power, because it comes from on high, comes from heaven. Glory to God, it's his. Inwardly given his divine power when you stay. That's the promise. And stay and wait, wait, wait. Acts 1, 4, gathering them together, he commanded them. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples just before he ascends. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Oh, it's the promise, his righteousness, his law within you. What the Father had promised, which he said, 
you heard of from me. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Ezekiel 36, 27, and I will pour out my spirit within you. That's what he's speaking of. That's the Father's promise. And he will do it. He did it in me. He did it in Jeff. He's done it in friends of ours. He has done it in many. But there are many who are still teaching righteousness as some kind of legal transaction between God and you, and then you can do what you want, and it's okay with him. I hate to hear those lies. Many are led astray down the broad path that leads to destruction. He does not desire that you perish, so listen to his truth. Set aside everything you think you know that you have heard from false teachers who are in the pulpits of churches all over the world. Stay and wait. Obey Jesus Christ. And you will have righteousness, his righteousness, in you forever. And his law will be written on your heart. That's the only way you can become righteous in his eyes. It is then that you know his righteousness intimately. Oh, it's in you. They, he and the Father and the Spirit are fully within you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. They are righteous, are they not? Completely, absolutely, perfectly righteous. Absolutely, they are. It is then that his law is literally, spiritually, written in your heart. I testify it's true in one moment of time. One moment of time, I was instantly changed. I went over to my neighbor who was spirit-filled and had said she was in prayer, and the Lord said she should ask me if I wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I had been praying for months. And the moment I was filled, everything was different. I went back home. Everything was the same in my house, and yet it was different. It was different. I was seeing everything as Jesus and the Father see it. And I opened my Bible, which I never understood before. Suddenly it was like, oh, of the light bulb came on. It is then that his law is written on your heart. It is then that his kingdom has come within you and his will will be done by you on earth just as it is done in heaven immediately and gladly. So, beloved, hear the words of Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, completely filled, from the King James, completely filled. Hunger and thirst after. Oh, I went after it starting in April of 2001. And I received it in November. Glory to God. It's for his glory, so that I'm different than the world, but I'm in the world as his witness. Hear the words of Paul from what he says about the Philippians, the believers at Philippi. Philippians 1.10, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere, that is pure, and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, not you, comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God, being filled with the fruit of his righteousness, because his righteousness has filled you. Oh my goodness. It's you become the living proof that he has done it, because you cannot possibly 
be righteous on your own. Then you are his witness here, as he promises in Acts 1.8. You are one through whom the world will believe that the Father sent the Son, as he prayed to the Father in John 17.21. I mean, this is what it's about. Righteousness as a legal transaction? Do you see him speak of it that way so far? He never does. So my exhortation is this. I'm going to ask you some questions here and there. Are you filled with his righteousness? Is his law written on your heart? Do you intimately know his righteousness? Have you experienced it? then you've no longer trusted in the legal definition. <laughs> you've trusted in his promises. And you have prayed accordingly and asked him to do it in you, and he has. Glory to God. That's what this is all about. You possess the righteousness which comes from God, as Paul writes. Philippians 3, 9, of himself, he says, I want to be found in him. I want to be found in him, he says, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Do you believe his promises? Then he will work them in you. Do not trust in trying to do his law, trying to be obedient to him in your own strength. You can't do it. None of us is good, not even one, from Romans 3.10. None of us is good until he makes us good on the inside. That's righteousness. If you reject these words, though, you are like northern Israel in the days of Hosea the prophet. Now, the Lord sent him to prophesy to northern Israel and to warn them. But... The reason he had to send him to do that was because they had abandoned the Lord. They had abandoned the Lord in order to follow after false gods who they thought would make them prosperous and happy. So in today's church, another Jesus is taught. 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Another Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible. Another kind of righteousness is taught. Oh, a legal transaction. Oh, it's taught everywhere. There are many, many false teachers in today's pulpits. There are many false ones in today's church boardrooms. And all the way up to headquarters for ministries. You have believed the teaching of false ones and sought natural blessings, just like northern Israel, from false ones, from false gods, instead of seeking to be filled with the blesser. You've sought your blessings from natural things instead of being filled with the blesser. What will his blessing be? Him in you, the Father in you, the Spirit in you. You have sought nothingness and emptiness instead. Hosea 10.1 Israel was a spreading vine, wandering. He brought forth fruit for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars. As his land prospered, he adorned his sacred stones. These were items of worship of false gods. So he increased his idolatry the more he saw himself prosper, he thought, at the hands of his false gods. So you're worshiping another Jesus who is false, who is nothingness, and who is emptiness. And if you prosper, you're saying it's because of this false Jesus who came to make your life better and who came to do stuff for you so that you could be healthy and wealthy and wise. 
but you do not see that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked because you're not filled with his righteousness. His law is not written on your heart. You're following after something false. So you seek to prosper in the natural, and then when you do, you say, oh, thank goodness for the world system that defies God. That's what I worship. Thank goodness that it does things for me. Good stuff. No. Here is his judgment of you if you are doing those things. Hosea 10.2, their heart is faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their sacred pillars. They speak mere words, verse 4. They speak mere words with worthless oaths. They make covenants. And judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. So with this very word he has given me, he wanted me to speak that because he is breaking down and destroying the altars you've made to you. The altars you've made to you, because that's what you're taught in today's so-called church. He calls you out today, for you are following false teachers who are telling you all you have to do is make this legal agreement with God, and then you can do whatever you want. He will destroy all of that. So now is the time to repent. Now is the time to see the truth that I've just taught you, that I've just shown you. These are his words, not mine. I'm not plucking something out of the air. This is not some kind of philosophical discussion. These are the words of God. If you continue to worship what you're worshiping now, a false Jesus where it's all about you and what he's going to do for you, then when you stand before him, you will be empty-handed. You will have nothing, none of his work to say, look, Lord, I did what you said. I obeyed your commandments. You won't even have to tell him that. If you stand before him like that, he'll say, Come in. (laughs) He'll say, come in. But you'll be judged. Just like he warns throughout the Gospels. If you sin, stop. Or he will send you to the place where the worm never dies. That means continual torture. And the fire is never quenched. Continual burning. So here is the cure. He has the cure. I've spoken it, be filled with the Spirit, obey his commandments. But Peter says it very well in 1 Peter 2.24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might, there's no might in the original Greek, so that we die to sin, die to sin and live to righteousness. That's why he came and died and rose. So that we die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, Peter says. Obey his commandments. And this will happen. You will die to sin. He will crucify your sin nature. He will purify your heart. He will fill you with the righteousness of God because God the Father God the Son, and God the Spirit will fully indwell you when you are filled. This is the cure. And it's very simple, but you have to humble yourself. And you have to throw away all the nonsense you've listened to all those years. I know someone who did that. (laughs) She did. She saw the truth. And she threw away everything she thought she knew. Everything she had been taught by false teachers. And she listened and she received. You know what? She's filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah, glory to him. All glory to him. I get a front row seat. Glory to God. He does the work. 
then you will be, if you will just obey, you will become the righteousness of God in Christ. You will become that because his righteousness will be in you. And you will not fear the day of judgment because you know, like I referred to earlier, he'll say, come on in, (laughs) come and join in the joy of your master. Well done, good and faithful servant. Glory to God. Therefore, repent. (sighs) Best thing I ever did. Repent and obey his commandments regarding the spirit. And you will be one who knows righteousness intimately. Lord Jesus, you would be so glad to do this in the sinning church filled with infants who are listening to nonsense. You would be so glad if there would even be one today who would see and who would turn away from all that and who would turn to you and say, Oh, Lord, work it in me. Let it be so, I pray. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.